Uh, you hear me all right, everybody? I hope you can. <laughs> My name is Marco Dominguez. I'm a consultant at Headspring. And well, today, we're going to be explaining a different stuff about the brownfield world. And uh, well, first of all, we need to know what is brownfield. Um, there are two terms, like the two terms that we need to know when we talk about the, the brownfield stuff, of course. One of them is greenfield and the other one is brownfield. So what is greenfield versus a brownfield environment? Well, greenfield is what you will call in the in the software environments, you will call a new project where a place where you can like take your own ideas and experiences and create somewhat uh, new from scratch, from square one, from the beginning and uh, take the whatever direction you want with your project. And a brownfield, it's a, um, a project that's already started with different ideas that are not yours that you need to keep in mind whenever you try to develop a new feature or create some new work over it. And uh, you need to, to improve upon it, right? That, those are the difference between a greenfield. So simple put, greenfield, it's a new project, Brownfield, is a project that already existed and you need to work on it. Um, the other term we are going to be using today is um, DevOps. And DevOps, it's literally the combination of two different words. One is development and the other one is operation. The word uh, born somewhere around 2008 and 2009 in Belgium, I think. And uh, it's related to automation of everything that can make easier the life of the developer, the team, and the co-workers in a uh, developing environment. <clears throat> this is to get rid of most of the human error possible, like trying to get everything done automatically without making, well, of course, doing anything manually. So this is usually done for agile uh, methodologies and procedures, it can work with some other methodologies, but it's usually done with Agile. And it breaks down everything into several builds and uh, several deployments. Most, like, if you're trying to commit any of your work, you will have something happening after you do it. So you can make sure that everything that you do works co correctly and perfectly fine each time you change anything. Uh, on the development side of things, for example, we have the, it's just an example, we're going to be talking about this in more detail on the presentation, but the, the testing part, for example, if, if you can automate your testings, for example, you can create a, a testing environment where you can change anything from your code on an existing feature and you can see live what it could uh, break or what could happen if something goes wrong. On the operational side of things, you can, for example, try to uh, create an automated process to deploy into several different environments and have like your development environment, your staging environment, your uh, productive environment, and a mirror of the productive environment and all that. And you can deploy to all of them in a single, single go, right? And well, that's about it. Greenfield, Brownfield, and the boss for the moment. Now, I leave you with Jimmy to talk about his first Brownfield project. Thanks, Marco. So, uh, my first experience, I say my first experience with a true Brownfield environment, I was just coming away from a product company where we were informed that our product was getting canceled. So, I needed to find a new job. And looking around uh, here in Austin, there's a number of big enterprise customers out there. And I really wanted to try to get that enterprise experience. Um, I was very naive at the time. I didn't understand all the bad things that, <laughs> that came with uh, large enterprises, um, but I wanted to have that experience. So I joined a company and I had a uh, very large existing project that I was gonna be working with. And they did a lot of on -time online retail so I was joining the team that did the cart and check process as well as order processing for a very large dot-com e-commerce e uh, solution. So I, with a very big company and they have 
something like billions and billions of dollars a year in revenue. I I naively assumed that they had all of their stuff together. They that they knew what they were doing, but it turns out that that usually is the exact opposite. That it is somewhat of a, a modern miracle that anything actually worked, and that any any orders ever actually got processed. So I joined. I had my very first day, um, and then this is basically what my desk looked like. Uh, where I was working at, we were in a, a very large cube farm. I'd say my my desk was a lot messier. This wasn't exactly my desk, but it's close enough. So uh, I got there on day one. My boss gave me my badge. I had to do the normal intro stuff. Um, I didn't I didn't see him for about three days. Uh, I didn't get a laptop yet either for about a week. It was uh, probably another warning sign. Um, but he did come on on the third day to see how he's doing, how our opinions are going. So I told him I didn't have my laptop yet. He said, "Okay, great. Now just one thing I need to warn you about. Um, there's a there's a computer you may have noticed under your desk. It's it's right down there. It's in the shadows now, but it's it's down there." And he had a warning for me. He said, "Jimmy, uh, whenever you're doing work, please make sure you don't kick that that computer." I said, "Okay." And I laughed, thinking that he was joking. Then he had a serious face. He said, "No, Jimmy. Seriously, do not kick that computer." Why? Why? Of course, I don't kick computers. So what's the big deal? Well, it turns out that, that was the production box underneath underneath my desk, and we called it the UND server because it was under my desk. Um, so that was just a taste of the things to come in the brownfield world that I was in. Now, once I finally got my laptop, that was about a week or so later, uh, we had the dev setup guide, which was how to actually get the application running on my machine. Now, I again kind of naively assumed that they under, like, they had some way, some instructions about how to actually get things working in the, in the machine. They did have some instructions. They were just very, very So once I, I printed it out, and I had to print it out because I couldn't keep scrolling back and forth between the different steps. So I had to print it out. I had a highlighter. I had a red pen, circling things that were missing, highlighting things that are important, passing things out to try to figure out how the heck to actually set up my, my own local environment. And it took me, I'd say a good week and a half, not only going through the big guide about how to set up machine, but just trying to get all the dependencies. If something didn't work, I'd have to go hunt down one of the other developers and say, hey, looks like this changed. What's going on? How can I, how can I fix this? And then, it'd be, yeah, that's right. Nine months ago, we switched from this control to this control library. And now you need to install this instead. Like, OK, that's great. Why didn't you update the document? But of course, like most documentation, it was almost always, always wrong. So that was my, that was my onboarding experience uh, at this enterprise company. Um, and then about, I'd say, five or six months in, we had our first big release, uh, big, uh, first big release of our project. Now, they were on a, every, they released every six months. And whenever they released, it was the entire organization released everything at the same time. So that meant that there wasn't just like a push button release that happened, and it wasn't just a release day. It was actually uh, a release weekend where people would show up on Friday afternoon, and then hopefully the release would be completed sometime on Sunday. That wasn't always the case. So our working environment was mostly sleeping bags and boxes of cold pizza that we would <laughs> we would take turns doing something and then okay now something's broken we have to get a hurt and fix it um, and then maybe we, we would sit there for hours while some other team did their stuff but it literally took the entire weekend for us to release the entire system now this this is the entire system so our dot com website as well as all the back end order processing fulfillment it all had to be released all at the exact same time or none of it will. I still don't, I just still don't, again, know to this day how exactly they conducted, they were able to conduct any business because a process this broken where it takes days and to actually just release anything, just again, how did they get anything done if it takes so very long? So again, I was, again, young and naive and things I, I asked about, it's like, why, why is this so bad? Um, I had come from a place where we were doing a greenfield project, and this was at a time when a, like a lot of these agile ideas were new and people were talking about them. So we were doing things like 
uh, automated builds, uh, automated tests, use some unit tests, some integration tests, and having an actual build and building installers to actually install a product on people's on people's servers and machines. And it didn't seem like that was too terribly difficult, but the, the, the difference was that was a, an entirely new project built from the ground up in my product team. So that was more of a greenfield scenario. But in the brownfield scenario, um, it, was, it was completely broken and I, I couldn't figure out exactly why and how things got so bad. And after about six months there, I realized that it wasn't really that it wasn't possible to make things better. And so it was just a lot of, I would say, um, people just, I would say they didn't care, but they didn't think it could get any better. They just didn't think it was possible to try to make the situation any better than it was. And so when you hear things about companies that release their software on a daily basis, or even someone like, I don't know, as the times per day, when you're sitting back as an enterprise developer, you think, oh, of course they can do that because they built it up. But if you actually go talk to some of those engineering teams, I've seen some presentations on Google and Facebook on how they actually do these sort of things. They actually all start out as more brownfield deployments because they just do the minimum amount to get the work done and then keep trying to build a product. Over time, they have to keep making their deployment process and their DevOps uh, environment better as they go. But they don't have to have everything started on day one. So, Usually when I ask why people, you know, why is it so bad here, I would just get people who are struggling say, well, I don't know. It's just the way it is. And that's how it's always been. So one of the first things that I had to fight when working in this brownfield environment was just, a, a, I'd say, a, an ad, it wasn't that people that, it wasn't that people didn't care. It's that they thought that it couldn't get better. And that was the first thing I had to really fight was try to try to get people to understand that it can be better, it can be different. Um, I tried a few different ways of communicating that, a few really bad ways, like saying how bad it was, <laughs> but then realizing that the people I was talking to actually built it. So when you're saying that their stuff is bad, it's usually not going to end well for you. So over the course of my time at this company, which wasn't too terribly long, so a little bit less than a year, um, from when I joined the company, or from when I accepted the offer to when I joined the company, uh, they actually had hired their CIO and hired a new one who then throws all development work whatsoever. So with all of my free time, I spend just trying to make our life better with our product. So my grand vision, my, my master plan, uh, was very first to, to go back to my first days on the team and think about all the things that were going wrong, all the difficulties I was having, and you say, what can I do just to make my own personal life better? My day-to-day -day work, my day-to-day -day development, whether it's the ramp up time, joining the team, or just on a daily basis, the things that I'm doing, how can I make my life better? Now, once I've done that, then I can start to look at how can I make my fellow developer lives better? So the different developers are assigned to my team. I had about six developers or so in this office, and I think we had another team of about 10 or so. Uh, they were part of a global team. So how can I, what can we do with our project to try to make our, our own collective lives better? Seeing the pain points that we had, the things we were spending on that weren't really adding value or adding code, and we're just trying to solve silly problems. How can we make those better? And then finally, how can I make my entire team's life better? So not just the developers, but what about the project manager? What about the, uh, the big folks that we had assigned to our team? What about the uh, build manager? What about the release manager? What about all this? Can we make our entire team's life better? But to kind of prove that I could do it correctly as I go, I really just wanted to start with making my own personal life better. Now, Marco and I work for a consulting company called Headspring, and what we typically do is build net new applications. We're building new applications, but it still is pretty frequent that we have to uh, look at existing applications or say, you know, we need to make a new system 
that make sure it can do the same things that the old system does. And in order to actually see what the old system does, I have to get it running somehow in my machine. So that's basically the time it takes for me to, as a new person showing up, how long does it take for me to see this, a login screen for that application? So the idea is that if I can get to this login screen and, and start to use the application, then I can, I can, then the entire application is up and running on my own local machine. So I call this measurement, the time to login screen, or TLS, which is, I guess, not to be confused with transport level security. I didn't think this acronym through, I guess. Maybe TTLS is better. Anyway, time to login screen is the amount of time from when a new developer starts, is when they show up new on the team, to when they can see a login screen on their developer machine. And the measurement that amount of time is a good measurement to see how well has this team automated its entire process. Because I generally found when it's very quick for a developer to start development as a new developer, then that generally means that the rest of the operational processes and release processes have also had the same level of rigor and attention. So for me, once I uh, join a new team or looking at an existing project, I look to see how long does it take for me from day one, how long does it take for me to be able to get the code, get all the dependencies running, uh, be able to build the application and run it to get to an actual login screen. But I find that for most brownfield projects, the TLS, or time to login screen, is not measured in minutes or even hours but typically days or even weeks. And there's a number of reasons why this happens, and they're all, all contribute to make this time really poor. But in general, that's, that's what I usually find is that for, for a lot of legacy projects, a lot of brownfield applications, it can take a very long time for a developer to get to where they can even start to be productive, actually developing or adding code. Now, if we can reduce this, the, th the activities we're doing to reduce the time to login screen should solve a lot of other problems that we'll find downstream as we look to automate our build and automate our deployments. So if we can fix this, we make this better, then it should make the developer and release experiences much, much better. So first of all, why is it so long? Why did it take so long? Especially the, the team that I was on. Why did it take? Why did it take me about two weeks to see that initial login screen? Why was it so so terribly bad? Well, if you remember from the first story I had was, uh, I didn't actually get a lap for several days to begin with, and in enterprise environments, it's typically the procurement department that does this. There's there's some department somewhere in the company who is in charge of when someone asks for something, they're in charge of actually getting it for that person. Now, it's often very far removed from the people that actually need the thing. So they're not, they're not usually embedded with IT or with your team. They're typically somewhere else. It looks, I think their sole job is really just to say no to people because people will ask for a lot of crazy things and they're the ones that are really making sure that, that the company isn't wasting a lot of money on purchases they don't need. Um, there are good ways of doing procurement and bad ways, but it seems like most of the large enterprises I work with have fairly difficult procurement processes. And in fact, this kind of joked about a lot um, about procurement people. They're typically, uh, they're typically people that, that have to say no a lot to people. People will be asking for uh, everything from kind of ridiculous hardware saying, I need a, I need a, I need a machine that's, once you finally price it up, it's, it's thousands and thousands of dollars, or they want 17 monitors, or they want some ridiculously nice chair, and someone has to say no to all those things, and that's typically the procurement person. So the problem is, when you have a legitimate thing you need, like a new developer coming on board with, that needs a new laptop, um, because all of those have to go through the same process, why it typically takes a very long time to actually go through that particular process. 
So that's one of the things I look at is how can we how can we fix this problem of just getting a machine to work with. Um, the best way that I've seen, if we, if we know that the procurement, just getting a machine or getting getting machines is difficult, whether it's getting a laptop or even getting a virtual machine for build or things like that, if that's difficult, then I follow a, a rule, um, the N plus one rule. That is, if I have six developers and there's those, those developers need six laptops. But in order to hedge against me needing one, I'll go ahead and ask for one additional one. So I always have N plus one machines around just in case I need to have someone come on board. Because I know if the, if, if the amount of time it takes um, when I ask for that resource, that my laptop or whatever, when I get it, if that's weeks or months, then that's a long time to wait. So why don't I just ask for a little bit extra? And then that way I have some extra laying around so that when a new developer comes on, I've already got something available and waiting for them. I do this with uh, with servers and things like that as well. If it's very difficult to acquire something like a virtual machine, then it doesn't hurt to just go ahead and get a little bit extra. That way you don't have to wait a very long time once you do that thing. One of the other big things I ran into were the tangled dependencies. So the application itself I was writing really wasn't that complicated. I mean, it's, it's literally a web application and then there's a, there was a web service backend, and then there was a, a Windows service in the background that ran as well to process orders. So those three things were very simple, um, but those three things had to communicate to a lot of other components in order to run properly. So it had to communicate to an address verification service to do address verification. It had to communicate to a fraud service to see to make sure people weren't trying to cheat us with orders. It had to connect to credit card verification services to make sure that the credit card numbers you entered were good. So all these things were a bunch of independent software that other people built, whether it's internal, external, and that was really what took the longest time because each of those was its own legacy brownfield project that had all sorts of crazy weird ways for it to be set up and configured. So my application itself didn't take too terribly long, but to get everything else going, that took absolutely forever. So one of the first things I did was our existing documentation on how to build and deploy everything was a word in SharePoint. Now, if everyone doesn't know this, the SharePoint is where good documentation goes to die because no one really updates Word documents inside of SharePoint. So one of the first things I did was in one of those uh, spare machines we had lying around, I installed sticky software on it so that our setup instructions were not just some Word document that was always a year out of date, but instead, it was a wiki that anyone could go in and edit. Now, this is one of those things that it can be better to ask forgiveness than permission. So I just installed some software on a local machine and said, hey, just for this local team, can we use this? If I asked anyone else outside of my team about a wiki, it would probably go to some enterprise architecture group where I sit in committee meetings for months or someone approve some wiki software that we can then get. But typically what happened is they would just come back and say, why don't you just use SharePoint? And then it'd be back where I started. So having something that's easy to edit, easy for anyone to collaborate on, means that that documentation can stay current. I also found that uh, the wiki doc itself, you can have actually links to things and attachments. So instead of me having to copy and paste things and go search the internet for how to do things. Instead, the wiki could actually just link to the correct documentation, the correct software to install at the correct version, all inside that wiki. One of the other things I did was I found that most of the, the links to download software were just either wrong or I couldn't find the older versions of things. So I had to go install some control library. Well, of course, the control library vendors, they update very frequently. I would go look go look for the older the, the version I needed, and it's just in, almost impossible on some of these control web, on the very websites to find older versions of things. So for things that are hard to install, they require like registration or something like that, um, our system is using Oracle, and that is also notoriously difficult to find the right version for. So what we wanted is taking all of those dependencies that require installations and making local copies on a file share that we had on that same laptop. 
So that way our wiki just links to the actual real thing we're supposed to install as opposed to you just it telling me, oh, install version 7.1. And it's just up to you to figure out how to find that version somewhere on the internet. The next thing I ran into was our team was all using a single shared database, which meant that we could easily override each other and step on each other's toes. So in order for me to connect it to that local developer database, it took something like two weeks for my security request to go through. Now, how this could be improved is by instead having everyone working on a local developer database as opposed to something that everyone goes out and shares. Now, one of the challenges of this is having good data inside the developer database. So there's some tools out there to be able to generate data, or you can do something like take a, take a snapshot of production and then clean it of any kind of personal information and make that your local developer database. Sometimes it's too difficult because those databases are too big. So just have to adjust, uh, adjust what the database looks like based on what you have available. The final thing I did was I scripted as much as I could. So trying to take that really big document that you had to follow step by step, and if you missed any one step, nothing would work. Uh, it just introduced the possibility of a lot of human error. So what I did at the time was try to convert as much as I could into some kind of automation script that would do it for me. Um, not necessarily because I was thinking of the next developer. I just found that I don't follow instructions well on documents. And so I kept having to go back and like, oh my gosh, it's not working. What is this? And inside that 30 page document, there were no checkpoints. So you had to finish the entire 30 pages before you saw if it worked or not. I wanted something that could be more incremental and I could uh, validate it as I went. Um, so luckily these days, there's a lot more automation tools to be able to build up your local environment. Um, some teams I, I work with will do things like create a virtual machine that has everything installed and then a developer just clones that virtual machines and goes. Other times using some kind of automation scripts, using tools like Chocolaty, which is a, uh, a program package manager for Windows, so you can install any kind of Windows software using the script. And of course, PowerShell itself has a lot of, of power and modules available to be able to automate things like setting up IIS, setting up Windows services, installing things. There's a lot there available for you. So at the end of my first two or three months on that team, because again, all the development had frozen, I had nothing to do, so why not automate everything? Uh, I was taking that 30 page Word document and got it down to a single setup script that someone can run and then set up, have their entire machine set up and ready to go. So now that my life was better, I wanted to hand it over to Marco, who would share his own story of his practical experience on local development. Uh, yes, well, the, let's say on the Mexican side of things, because I'm, I'm from Monterrey, Mexico, and I'm talking from there at the moment, so I, my experience is more oriented on this, on this side of the, of the river. And, you know, there's a huge uh, need for brownfield uh, project resolution here in Mexico. A lot of the companies that we work with here are related to all projects that already existed for a lot of time. This was the first, well, it's the second job that I had, the first one with a real, like, developer, developer title, and it was for a company that or with insurance companies, and we manage the clients for the Medicare and Medicaid things when Obama was in the, in the presidency of the United States. This is the first time I got to know those two terms, and I knew nothing about uh, insurance companies like at all, uh, and knowing about social security numbers and all that kind of stuff. It, it was completely new for me. So I didn't know any better. I didn't know that there was any other way of doing things. That I didn't know about DevOps. This was, this was like six or seven years ago. So there was no way for me to implement this new thing. I was a freshman just out of college. And I, I didn't have any knowledge on how to do this kind of stuff. 
Um, so, you know, and, and well, and even if you had a, if, if, and even if I had the knowledge on how to work out the DevOps, maybe I was not going to be able even to to take the the like the project on my hands just as Jimmy did on, on his own experience because being a freshman here in Mexico it's complicated and you're always uh, you need to be always ready for the newer tasks like or small tasks or whatever legacy ticket is stuck whatever in some board in the bottom of a bucket. So we had a lot of clients. This is the first time I tried to work with insurance companies. I didn't know anything about them and we don't have any automation at all. Nothing at all. So it took me about one month, that's four weeks or 30 days for, uh, well, to get to the login screen. It was one month and we have more than 30 clients and that was that was for just one of those 30 clients. It was impossible to manage all those clients locally. We didn't have local copies of our, of our uh, databases. We only could load the repo and then connect remotely to another database somewhere else in the world. And we needed to work uh, fully on some application that a Romanian team developed like two years ago or such. And uh, it was it was very complicated to work in that part for myself. It was very difficult for a new hire to start working on it right away. And that's a loss of productivity. Like you can improve whatever you're trying to do and whatever your value is and the value of your company and your team is, you can improve it just by having everything ready uh, to start working right away once you join a company. We, don't, we didn't have any Git knowledge either. We used TFS because TFS at that time was like the, the best thing in the world and then we realized it wasn't and we changed to Git. But at that moment, we were trying to do the best we can with what we had and what we had wasn't that good. Just try to imagine, try to imagine what it could have been with everything that Jimmy told us, like whatever you just said, whatever you think about it, like having a build script to create our environments and having a living documentation and all that, imagine how much it could have been reduced the time for me of going through 30 days of not knowing anything, of not knowing anybody, nobody talking uh, to me about creating a, a like my local environment and uh, so very people so very little people uh, that already knew the project like there were four experts in the whole project and uh, all of that combined maybe if we could have the DevOps at that moment we could have I, I could have reduced the time from 30 days to three and this is based on certain experiences from now that I that I know that it will take me at most three days to work correctly with a even in a brownfield environment or a legacy app, whatever I can start working if I have the correct scripting at the at the beginning of the project, I can start working on it at most at three days after I start in the company or wherever. And that gives a lot of competitive advantage to all of us because now if you if you are the one that knows how to do this kind of stuff, you can sell this to a client and, and make them believe that what you're trying to sell them is the best productivity waste that, that you can think of instead of just telling them like, well, I will take a lot of time planning some stuff that will not be used in the future. No, I'm planning this because this will reduce the time that we're going to be taking on creating our environments in the future. And maybe this will take a month to get done. But after that, you can hire anybody and it will be ready in three days instead of hiring anybody and having them ready after one month for each person. And back to you, Yumi. <laughs> Thanks, Marco. Yeah, it does 
those experiences, uh, those are enough to scare people away from software development, I think. Feeling that you want to be productive, that it's taking you an entire month. To actually, it's a horrible feeling. So in my, uh, in my, brown, uh, my brownfield job that I was in, after I've got my life, my own personal stuff, where I thought I felt pretty good about what I was doing, the next thing I wanted to do was start to try to make my developer coworkers' life better. Now, this is this can be a little bit tricky um, because a lot of the original developers could still be on the team. So I want to make sure I don't upset anyone, and I try to approach approach it with a lot of empathy. Now, when I talk to people about why are things as as they were, why were things so bad as I saw them? Um, it was a lot of the shrugged shoulders, well as it was a lot of apathy. So a lot of this uh, work is not only just to improve how we work together, but also try to change our culture and our attitude to say, instead of just accepting how things are, can we work to try to make things better? Can we feel empowered that we have the permission to try to make things better? And once the team feels empowered to make things better, that's when I start to see things actually start to happen. So one of the first things I did was our our system didn't actually have any build whatsoever. So the very first step was just to, just to get a build, just to build something, just to do something to say, make sure we're just not breaking each other. And a team I was on before that didn't have any kind of automated build, it was very often where someone would check in something and it, would, it wouldn't even compile because they'd, fix, you know, they'd, they'd done something, compiled, and then changed something and then forgotten to compile before they pushed it up. And so of course they would, break everyone else in the team because it wouldn't even compile. So at the very least, we can look at just trying to get a build together to just build something. Uh, now, there's a number of different build servers out there. I won't go into all of them, but there are some that are cloud-based, like Visual Studio Team Services, also known as VSTS. There's a few others out there. Um, so if your, your organization is cloud-friendly, that's might be a good option. There's also a lot of on-premise versions as well. So that are both, uh, both products you can purchase, like Visual Studio TFS and BetBrains Team City. There's also open source projects out there as well, like Jenkins. So that extra laptop that we uh, had earlier, that we kept around, uh, also became our new build server. So we wound up installing Jenkins on that build server or on that extra laptop to become our new build server. And this build server at the very, very beginning just compiled. It was just make sure that whatever you did, didn't, it didn't break anything. That was the most important thing. Just make sure you didn't break everybody else. And once you have that in place, you can start to build on top of it. And to do this, even if you can't go through procurements, uh, you can find really any machine available to be able to do this build. So whatever like kind of old old PCs or old laptops you have hanging around, those ones that someone's made into a file server, those are good opportunities to say, hey, can we use this machine that's just sitting around and I mean, you can use it for something productive, like a build server. Um, and that way it's the team that owns it, not to ask anybody because nobody cares about these old, these old boxes that are just sitting there gathering, gathering dust. So we'll just have to be creative in how we find these machines to work with. I'll often be talking with multiple teams as well to say, hey, do you have any spare you know, crappy laptops? Or sometimes I'll notice people like, they'll have three laptops in their desk. And when they're like, why do they have three? Well, no one asked for their old ones back. They got new laptops, but never gave the old ones back. So, okay, well, can we use your old laptop instead? Now, in order to try to fight the, the apathy of the team and say it's okay to get better, one of the things I did was started a book club on some relevant topics. So instead of trying to look at topics that are very forward thinking, like uh, building microservices with Docker and Kubernetes, well, that's great, except it won't help me with my current situation. So trying to have books that can, who have material that can actually help what I'm trying to do. And these are the, some of the best books that I found. We had, and we actually went to these book clubs. Uh, one is, my favorite one is Working Effectively with Legacy Code. Um, that's from Michael Feathers. And a couple of refactoring books as well that can show us how we can actually change the code. A lot of the times our team was really scared to change anything. But once we get that automated build in place, it enabled us to be able to make changes and know if we broke something. So now that we can make changes, let's look at the actual tools and techniques to be able to make changes and improve our code over time. Now, 
in a modern DevOps environment, you're supposed to have, you know, lots and lots of unit tests and tests and tests and tests. Everything's automated. But for an existing existing system in an application, um, it could be a little bit tough. Like, how, how do you get started just adding tests to an existing application? Well, for a lot of teams I, I run into, they don't even, they've never uh, written a test before in the first place. So a lot of times what we'll do is try out some group refactoring or TDD, what's known as katas, um, which are sort of practice exercises in a isolated, simplified problem area. Um, a very popular one is bowling, um, to build a bowling game using unit tests to help drive that out. Um, I don't actually know the rules of bowling, so that might not be a good one for me. Uh, but there's a lot of a uh, lot of these kinds of instructional avenues available in mine. And we usually under the term kata, which allows you to practice as a group. So we did this on our team. We practiced together, saying, "Okay, let's let's do this during our lunch hour and see how it see how it ends up." Now, once we got practice writing tests. We go back and look at our existing application and say, well, gosh, the application is so tangled. It's one of these big balls of mud. It's not easy for us to write existing unit tests or write new, new unit tests for existing behavior. Maybe we can do it for new behavior, but for existing stuff, um, we couldn't really write any unit tests. So that working effectively with legacy code gave us some techniques to be able to do so, but we need something a little bit better. So we just had a mantra of just trying to test something having some confidence that the application can actually do what it's supposed to do. And the best way we could do that is through some kind of automated UI tests. So something that actually runs the application, clicks around, fills in some values, and then uh, you get some, hopefully, result on the other side. And this let us at least under make sure that the, uh, when we made a change that we didn't completely break the application. Now we made a mess, we made a broken logic somewhere, so maybe a unit test, had we written it, would have failed. But at the very least, we wanted to make sure that the application still ran as a whole. So just getting started with some, some kind of tests at an overall application level can help you give confidence to the team that they can start to make more and more changes and start to add uh, low-level tests. Now, you do have to be careful with this technique because UI tests can be overdone. Um, so you do need to respect what's known as the testing pyramid. And the idea of the testing pyramid is that you build a base of unit tests, and these are tests that don't go on a process. If you don't hit a database, they don't hit uh, any external web services you can't control. Um, but these are the bulk of your tests. And then at the top of the pyramid, you have, for most of our projects are, are more optional, but you have some UI tests. The idea is that as you move up the pyramid, you'll have fewer and fewer of those tests. Um, if you invert this pyramid, as you have the bulk of your bulk of your tests as UI tests, the problem is that those tests are much, much, much slower, several orders of magnitude, sometimes a thousand times slower, sometimes a hundred thousand times slower than unit tests, and they have a more likelihood of them breaking versus unit tests. So Although it's a good technique to start out to say, we'll just get some automated UI tests to see, does the application work? Um, as you start to go, you'll want to start building more and more unit tests using those techniques from the previous books. And the final thing is to be careful about is don't call the obviously ugly baby ugly. So even though the application is really difficult to build, really difficult to run, really difficult to set up, it's still important not to talk out about it, because that can also have a really negative effect on your team, especially if those original developers are still on the team. They probably, they may already know that it's not that great, but telling them how bad it is isn't going to really improve the situation. So I try to keep things positive, try to think, focus on things we can fix, and, and try, to, try to at least combat the apathy as much as possible people feel like you're just beating up on them, then they're much less likely to try to help you. So I can't focus on the end goal of saying, okay, how can we improve this? How can we make this better? Um, and not how bad is it at this point in time? So Marco, story time. Uh, yeah, well, the story that I was telling before is only the our journey 
on that company that I was working with or those insurance companies. Um, of course, after one month of struggling and finally getting to the log screen of one of those different environments, well, it took me only, I don't know, maybe a week to get another environment working. Along the way, I only worked on seven different environments in the whole process, so it wasn't that bad in a year and a half. But still, I started working and everything was, well, manually done. Of course, I had to, I had to, well, I had to wait for a request from the client, a ticket, whatever I needed to do, download the correct repo for whatever client we was, we were working for connect to the correct DV remotely on the development environment, have all the credentials to do so, test manually whatever I, I created. Of course, push that to the dev server, test again on the dev server, and then send a personal message to a QA member. Uh, at this point, the QA team, well, one of several QA teams, uh, had to evaluate the, the, the change and of course they have a certain way of doing stuff and if everything was correct and everything passed, well, they needed to manually move the files from, this, from the development environment to the staging environment. Manually take physical files into, from one place into another. And I had to tell them exactly what was the URI or both of those addresses. Like, you need to take, you're going to take this DLL from this place in this folder and you need to move it to this place, to this folder. For each change we made, all of the team, every one of us, we needed to do that with one of the QA people. This, of course, generated a room full of tensions from time to time just because they didn't understand quite fully what we were doing. There were no automated tests, not a single one automated test in the whole project, not one. So there was no way for us, but of course we needed to test manually, but there was no way for us to demonstrate to the QA team fast that we were doing things correctly and they should only worry about the functionality on the, on the, on the front end side to make sure everything works correctly on that end. But trying to explain them all that we do and make them make them understand that what we do was correct or not or whatever, you know, the struggles of talking to the QA team when you are a developer and it's and it's perfectly fine. I mean, you never know if if you're if you're going through something, if you're going through the a very difficult process as a developer, we don't know what process they're going through and to keep the best intentions possible between the team and the, the best environment, the working environment, it's, it's very difficult and in, in the end we start yelling at, at each other just trying to make our point stand out from the others and all this could have been avoided just by testing everything ourselves, having a test environment, just trying to work out what what was happening behind all the the code that we developed and make them make their lives easier while making ours easier too. And uh, that's it for the second part. Back to you, Yuri. Thanks, Marco. Um, so where we are now is we've we've made my life better. We've made my coworkers lives better. And the last thing I want to do is make my entire team's life better, basically from development to production. Now we can use a lot of things we've built off of making my own personal life better and my dev coworkers life coworkers life better. And then trying to apply those same kind of things to the overall delivery process. Now the very first thing that I had to do in my situation was just actually understand what the process was. So in this organization, there was a lot of throwing things over the wall that is we would finish something and then we would go to a build manager but none of us actually met the build manager 
we pass it over Skype every now and again, but we, I didn't actually understand what that process was. So what I wound up doing was talking to pretty much anyone that touched the delivery process to understand what were their steps that they were performing, what they were doing, and uh, watching them actually do the work to see uh, telling me lining up to what they what they actually do because sometimes when people explain something they'll skip steps or things something is obvious so watching them do the work means I have a full understanding of the process. Uh, the next thing I would do with the, to it was was to map it out on a whiteboard. And this, for example, is a great book I found to map things out. It's called Value Stream Mapping. It's a it's a technique uh, for mapping out processes. And one of the things that you can do whenever you map out a process is start to gather some measurements about how long a lot of steps take and then how long it, you're waiting for some step to happen. And so that was the next step we had was to just measure the process. So we had this release process that took a whole weekend. But I didn't really know what all those steps were happening, what we were doing and really what was going on. So I wound up mapping it out and saying, what are the actual steps that are happening as part of the process? Uh, mapping out how long it takes to perform those steps, and then also looking at the amount of time we'd have to wait between steps. So our team, for example, we weren't actually, quote, doing deployment for the entire weekend. We had a whole bunch of downtime of doing nothing. And then once someone told us it was our turn to be ready, there'd be this furious activity going to actually do the deployment, which took several hours. And once we were done, we would stop and just kind of wait for the rest of the deployment to be done. So understanding the entire process allowed us to say, okay, as we improve it, is the overall process improving? One thing I wasn't really prepared for were the number of silos in the organization. So this organization did not put all the people together on a team, a cross-functional team. They had individual silos for every single group. So there was a development group in IT, there's a QA organization, there's a project management organization, and of course, probably the most difficult, uh, at least there to work with, were the database administrators because they were always the one that got blamed when something was slow. Um, and they always pointed at the application developers at uh, us writing bad code with why, with why it was being slow. Um, so that's something I wasn't really prepared for, but in a, in a real actual DevOps environment, we're building more cross-functional teams where each of these groups is on the same team. So as much as possible, I started to involve those people into group conversations about how the whole process works so that everyone understood everything that was going on. Um, now, as, as I started to improve the situation, one of the, one of the ideas that came up was, well, this is such an important activity. Should we hire for someone to do this? Um, I would be careful of that, but because DevOps is a it's a culture, it's a mindset. It is not a title or a position or a team. Just like you don't have agile is not a title, agile is not a team, agile is not a person. There are roles in an agile team with different responsibilities, but agile itself is not a position or a title. DevOps is the same way, even though you can still search for DevOps jobs and you'll get lots and lots of results, but uh, they're missing the point that these are probably infrastructure engineers for these kind of jobs, but probably to sell the title, they call it DevOps instead. Just a word of precaution. So for us, when we were going to automate our build, we, we took that automation that I did for the local development setup and basically just parameterized it. So instead of me hard coding in things like configuration values and such, Instead, we parameterized the, that setup build and said, can we make this as part of our automated deployment? And that actually got us most of the way there. So that work I put in earlier of automating my local development setup paid off big time when we went to actually automate the entire deployment. Now, for our system with a bunch of legacy tools and applications that we had to connect to, uh, it was difficult to find out how to automate some of those pieces. But that was one thing I also found that these days, if you try to automate something, someone has typically done it before. It's very rare these days that I to say I run into some patient and I, and I start to Google uh, automate, deploy, whatever, and I should get some results. Hopefully, it's not just a Stack Overflow question 
with no answers from five years ago, that would be the worst. Um, <laughs> but I should have typically someone has done it for, and you can start to lean on the work that other, other folks have done. Uh, we try to automate as much as possible everything that was related to the deployment process. Um, this is a tool for deployment called Oculus Deploy, but there's a number of tools out there to do this. Um, is the idea is to automate as much as possible the release process. It's still a human actually pushing the button, but it should be completely automated how to get this uh, project all the way to production. So in our group, we cut our deployment, it was several hours down to just a few minutes by automating the entire process. In that case, we use installers because that was the thing that was at fault for us. These days we could use uh, some better deployment techniques, but we automated the entire process so that our step in the three days was very, very fast. And we spent the rest of the time just eating pizza and playing poker, basically. One of the things that can be difficult to deal with are database changes. It's even if you have a, a central database team, um, we found that they were often the bottleneck in any kind of changes that needed to be happened. So anytime I go into a new scenario where uh, I'm having to deploy database changes along with my application changes, I'll look at using database migrations as a means of doing so. Database migrations are, I find a lot better model for doing database changes over time uh, because they're much more aligned with standard continuous integration source control practices. There's a number of products and tools out there, out there, uh, both paid and free versions, but this was, regardless of the database environment I was going into, getting database integrations was essential for us to having a complete uh, automated story for production deployments. And the final thing we wanted to do to say that all this work was worth it is to measure our progress, to say, what used to take us days now takes us minutes, and that just gets us that much more productive, that much faster. So onboarding time, that time to log in screen, taking it from a month and to a day, even the developers more productive uh, and produces more and can be more productive more quickly. If I reduce the deployment time, it means I can do that deployment more often. But in order to sell this effectively to management, sometimes you have to keep track of these measurements. And so I'd encourage you to do so as you're going along these journeys to measure what it was before and then measure what it was afterwards so that you have a good story to tell for management to say we should start to do this more across our company well i think we're actually at time so i'm going to go down to the uh some key takeaways here um so first is to start local with what the problems that you have uh start with what things that you can do for your own personal development environment. Start to expand that outwards from there to your local team and perhaps even your entire development process. Automate as much as possible. And probably most important of all is to practice empathy. Put yourselves in the shoes of the other people on your team, other people in your company, and understand that there's probably no one there that's doing anything maliciously to make things bad as they are. It's just uh, people that have accepted how bad it is. For some further reading, the two favorite books I have, uh, uh, first are The Phoenix Project, and the second one is a follow-up that's more technical-oriented, is The DevOps Handbook. Um, I wanted to thank everyone for joining, and that was uh, DevOps in a Brownfield World. Thank you. Really great conference. I think we have time for one quick question. If someone want to ask, um, is someone, si alguien tiene una pregunta.